Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back to the Realist Podcast in the Dunya, the three Muslims. Before we get started on today's stream, we just got another quick announcement. So our collection dropped, alhamdulillah, so go get yours today. The link is in the description. Right now, I'm wearing the two-piece. I got the sweater, just like the brother there, and I got the oversized tee as well. That's what makes it look so amazing. Allahumma barak. So keep in mind, in 13 days, it will be closed. And we will not be releasing it again. Or more likely, when we sell out, it will be closed and we will not be releasing again. And 10% of the profits go to the masjid being built in Norway and the earthquake victims. So click the link, support the merch. And I'll see you guys in a second. Fayad, bring everyone up, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brother Muhammad, also known as the Muslim Lantern, you're muted right now. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's finally happening, man. So, I've seen, personally, I've seen your content um, a little bit here and there for a while now. And I've always noticed just such elegance in your dawah. And I'd love, inshallah, to get into that. But first, before we talk about the street dawah, which is what the people know you for, I want to talk a little bit about the Muslim lantern and why you started dawah. So, what made you just pull up on the street one day and start teaching Islam? Well, I, I think uh, first we say Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa Salatu Salam, wa Rasulillah, wa Ala Alihi wa Sahbihi wa Ala Ma Baat. So uh, <laughs> I'm the type of person <laughs> who doesn't like to get a lot uh, into personal issues and stuff like that. But I'll give you a general overview, right? So basically, I think family upbringing is a very important thing. That's what I personally think. I think it goes a long way uh, into your future as a human being, how you were raised, how your family influenced you when you were young, right? When I was young, I used to, my, alhamdulillah, I have uh, religious parents that used to teach me about Islam, things like that. And the interesting thing is when I was young, I used to like uh, learning about Islam. So I, I used to actually enjoy it. I used to enjoy going to the mosque, listening to the lectures of the scholars. Uh, while while you see like other children, they would like to go play soccer, football, etc. Whenever my father is going, he says to me to come. I used to enjoy it. I used to go there. You, you, they, we used to always have this like competition. And then you have the sheikh. He gives a reward to whoever answers the question and stuff like that. I used to enjoy it, basically. I used to find it fun. I used to enjoy seeking knowledge always. So it was something that was a part of my uh, my daily life, right? Alhamdulillah, I studied in, uh, you can say, throughout all my life I was studying Islam. Uh, since I was young until I, I reached the uh, university and also studied in university, etc. And then after that, then uh, I've seen some, uh, seen some personalities in the da'wah scene. I've seen people given da'wah, come across videos of the corner, come across different people given da'wah and that was always a passion for me to to engage with someone speaking about islam obviously you, you listen to this hadith of the prophet والسلام, and how is one person accepting islam through you is better than you know the, the anything in the world if you if you want to put it in that uh, understanding or description right so that was always on my mind and because i used to enjoy islam i wanted to convey islam so and you can see that in 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 a country like here like the uk we're not fulfilling our obligations, Muslims, conveying the message. It's an issue. And you can say that throughout the Muslims, whoever is living in a non-Muslim country, we're not fulfilling our obligation, unfortunately. And there is a high demand, the highest demand I've seen on Islam recently. People are eager to learn about the religion. People are so excited about Islam. People, they, they want to know what we believe in, right? And we get sometimes people on the da'wah table, they say we ask our Muslim friends, but they don't answer us. So it's not that, that we're not even doing our job, but that people are coming to us and we're not answering them, which is a huge issue. Do you understand? It's it's like to, it come to that level that they're so curious that they broke the barrier of fear. They are coming to you to ask you about your own religion and you're not providing them with information. You're not answering their questions, etc. So uh, there is this obligation upon us all as Muslims and we need to all keep this verse in mind in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَلَيَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ let there be from among you a group of people, a nation, a small group of people or a group of people that call to good and call away from evil. And then Allah finishes the verse with this beautiful ending. Those are the successful ones. So Alhamdulillah, I wanted to be from the successful people. You know, If I can be, if Allah accepts from me, to be from amongst the successful people, to do the job of the messengers, 
the thing that Allah Azza honored the prophets and the messengers and made them examples for mankind, for mankind using. And obviously, we're very deficient. Uh, I'm, I'm not doing as as uh, I should be doing. I'm not. I shouldn't be in that position to begin with. But when there is a need, you have to do something. You have to at least convey what you know. So Alhamdulillah, يعني, this is just a basic overview of, of the reason why I got into that way. All right, Alhamdulillah. So would you say that Dawa is an obligation upon every single Muslim, whether you know they're on the street or just at work or at school? Well, Dawa, according to, to the scholars, Dawa is a Fard Kifaya. So it's a communal obligation, which means a part of the community has to fulfill that obligation. Otherwise, the full community is sinning. Uh, so, for example, like Salatul uh, Al-Janazah, like, for example, the, the prayer of Janazah, you got a group of Muslims have to perform it on the dead person. If no one performs it, all the Muslims are sinning because no one is fu fulfilling that duty, right? But if a group fulfills it, then we don't need to do it too, right? This is generally the ruling of Da'wah, but that ruling can change based on the scenario situation that you're in. Mm -hmm. If you are in a scenario where someone needs Da'wah, he needs to learn about Allah, he's asking you about Allah, and you've got that knowledge, then it becomes far Ain becomes an obligation upon you as an individual to deliver that message. And this is the problem. In the West today, we, a lot of us has become, especially in this country, or it depends on which country you are, depends on your situation, but it becomes fardain upon you. It becomes an obligation upon you. There are people around you that you know are doomed to eternal hellfire if they die as disbelievers. You cannot just walk past them as, as if you don't care about their, their afterlife. If you've got any mercy in your heart as a believer, then you have to, you will want to engage with those people. You will want as much as you can, obviously, because knowledge is very important. We're not saying engage without knowledge. We're not saying speak without knowledge. We're not saying because that can cause more harm than it causes, than it does good, right? But we're saying for anyone who can convey anything that he knows, that he's certain of, it becomes an obligation for you at least. What I usually say to the people, look, if you're afraid that you don't have the eloquence to engage with the people, tell them information about Islam and teach them, what you can easily do, just give them a copy of the Quran. Say, look, this is, here is my gift to you. I uh, Thank you. Uh, how are you? Are you okay? I've always seen you, you know, and I wanted you to learn about us and what Muslims believe. Here you go. Do you like to read the copy of the Quran? No one will say ever no. No one will say no to a gift, you know. <laughs> Everyone will accept a gift. So you can always do it that way. If you feel you're not able to engage with them yourself, you're not able to answer their questions, just give it to them. If they then become curious after reading and they start asking you questions and you're not qualified, take them to someone who is, go take them at least to an imam of a masjid or anyone that you know who's knowledgeable who might be able to engage with them, teach them a bit and take them a step forward. But yes, in most situations for Muslims who are in the West, um, these days I would say it becomes a fardain, uh, an obligation on each person. So right. as I said, it all depends. Yeah. yeah, beautifully said. Jazakallah khair. So I'm imagining a situation like you just painted. Someone goes to a regular Muslim, they ask a question. You know, they see the person has a beard or they pray or they see a sister in hijab and they ask a question and the person doesn't know. Do you think that person should go back home, whether they interact with the, you know, the non-Muslim again or not? Should they go back home and start learning their deen? Is seeking knowledge on Islam to be able to answer these questions also an obligation? Yeah, absolutely. So that's another obligation, right? And subhanAllah, yeah, Shaykh Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, when he was he was given advice for, for the Muslims in, in, the, in the minorities. They were minorities in non-Muslim countries at that time. He gave a full lecture, which is one and a half hour or something like that. I, I would advise anyone who speaks Arabic to listen to it because it's very beneficial, especially for people who are uh, involved in the Da'wah, right? And he answers very common questions, that are things that we come, uh, we come up with. Uh, on a daily basis as people who try to do da'wah in the West, right? And what he mentions is, it, uh, you cannot do da'wah without knowledge, right? He says, he quotes the Quran, or the Prophet, where Allah commands the Prophet to say, قُلْ say, هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي This is my path. أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرًا I call to Allah Azza wa Jal upon knowledge. أَنَا وَمَنِ اتَّبَعْنِي Me and those who follow me, those who follow the same path, they have to do the same thing. They have to be upon basira. You have to be upon knowledge, you have to be upon wisdom, you have to be upon understanding. You need to know what you're doing. And then the Sheikh, he says, because the person of knowledge can do attacking and can do defending. He can do both. You have to be in that position. Defending meaning that you will defend any doubts or shubuhat that someone comes up and he tries to put forward against Islam when he's speaking to you. Right? And attacking means that you will put forward the message in a strong eloquent way that where you engage and give the people the message, right? So you have to be able to do the, these two things. If you're not able to, to do these two things, you cannot do proper da'wah, right? And you cannot do those two things without knowledge. Knowledge is literally your weapon. It's your shield and, and, and sword. 
if you have no shield and sword, <laughs> you cannot fight, you know, you're not going to be able to engage with the people. So then the Sheikh says, what happens is that you will get da'wah done to you. Wow. This is what will happen, right? Yeah. You will get those people with the shubuhat, instead of you inviting them to Islam, they will take you away from Islam. Wow. And and then the Sheikh says something very important as well. He says that you are a representation there of Islam. So when, and he gives an example, if someone stands in a public place and someone asks them a question about Islam, and then he's silent, he's not able to answer that doubt, how does that look for the image of the religion? How does that look for the image of Islam? He says yeah. that looks like the religion is being defeated. While in reality, it's just a, an ignorant person standing who's not able to convey or answer these questions, right? And then the Sheikh mentions something important as well to keep in mind, because we don't want to discourage the people. The Sheikh mentions and he says that that doesn't mean that you don't do da'wah when you're seeking knowledge. That's a very important thing to keep in mind, yeah? Because then people, they lose the balance. They say that, look, I'm going to uh, do the da'wah. Sorry, I'm only going to do da'wah and again the knowledge. So now I'm focusing on the knowledge, I'm not going to do da'wah. No, 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 you can do both. But the Sheikh says, what you will preach when you are learning and doing da'wah what you can teach is only what you learn you stay at what you learn if you learn something you stop there that's yeah. what you do basically right that, so that's, that's what the sheikh point. yeah that's what the sheikh advises and he finishes by another thing is that you need to have two things the knowledge and the deeds you need to combine between the knowledge and the actions so you cannot be just person who believes and say to the people do qiyamul layl and then you don't do qiyamul layl Read the Quran. You don't. You don't need the Quran yourself, right? Yeah. So uh, that would be like a general overview, I would say. That's a beautiful point, and I'm glad you made the distinction because I find a lot of people, and I think unfortunately it's only natural for human beings to want to do this. But whenever they don't know, especially if they're in a public sphere, they kind of make up an answer or just say what makes the most sense to them at the time, and then Yanni. Unfortunately, sometimes what comes out is is very very incorrect and. Uh, May Allah forgive us and protect us from this. But I, mean, I think the best approach would just be, okay, you know, that's an interesting point. Personally, I've not looked into it. As an individual, I have not looked into it. Let me go back and find an answer. Let me go ask those who do know, and I'll come back and bring you an answer. I think that's the most respectable thing that could be done in, in that moment. And, and the question is this. If I were to say this to someone who's not a Muslim, what is the worst thing they could say back to me? A great they question. cannot say anything. All they can do is they say, "Okay, I respect that." They will respect. They have to respect you. You've stated that. Look, this is not my field of knowledge. The problem: people are afraid to look bad. Mm. But in reality, you will be, look good because they will respect you that you stop in which what you know. You only yeah. say what you know, and there was ne there's never gonna be any bad response that you would receive if you say that. Yeah, amazing, amazing, absolutely, especially since. Yani, you're supposed to look the religion. You're sorry, you're supposed to make the religion look good. You know, imagine Absolutely. you're focused on making yourself look good. Now Islam looks bad because you're trying to show off or whatever. May Allah forgive us, man. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, and we do get Subhanallah, a lot of people on the table, unfortunately, because of that. They come with questions and then they say, but Islam says this. I say, no, Islam doesn't say this. He says, no, but my Muslim friend told me. <laughs> Therefore, Islam says this, right? So they've they've gone. They, they already think they know about Islam. Mm. And the reason they do is because they got it from a Muslim. They learned it from. So it's not the fault, to, to be honest, because they trusted you as a Muslim and they thought that you would be telling them the truth. So then when I tell them that, no, this is not correct, they get, uh, they, they get surprised. Okay, why did my Muslim friend say this to me? Then I just say to them, bring him with you next time. You know. <laughs> but generally, this, subhanAllah, this is what happens. People just say whatever it is and uh, they just want to speak. The passion is there, but the knowledge is not there. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. So what would be your response to those that come for the sole intention of trolling or wasting time? Mm, that's a great question, right? <laughs> so I would say, subhanAllah, it depends as well on... I wouldn't like deal with everyone the same way. So some people, I will give everyone a chance, that's what I would say. Mm. So I'll give everyone a chance in the beginning, in the initial stage. And then when you do da'wah for a long time, you're instantly able to tell whether a person is sincere or not. And what I say to the people generally, what the, the most important thing I learned in the da'wah that I've done is that there is only two types of people, sincere and insincere. There is no third category. So if you're speaking with someone, it's either he's there to waste your time, he's not sincere, he's not looking for the truth, it doesn't matter what you throw in his face, he's not going to accept it, and you've got a sincere person who's genuinely curious, right? So when someone comes to you on the da'wah table, it all depends on their behavior, how they start off, how they behave in the beginning, you will have to judge based on the apparent, right? Mm -hmm. So if he behaves in a, in a certain way, you will respond based on the behavior that he would show you. 
right? And then you will take it from there. You will see, is that person just there to waste my time? If he's there to waste my time, then it's an obligation on you as a Muslim not to engage with him. You would say to him, sorry, but I can't engage with you. I can't talk to you. Why? Allah Azza wa Jal teaches that in the Quran. Allah Azza wa Jal tells us in the Quran that وَإِذَا سَمَعْتُمْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ يُكْفَرُ بِهَا يُسْتَهْزَأُ بِهَا فَلَا تَقْعُدُوا مَعْهُمْ حَتَّى يَخُوضُوا فِي حَدِيثٍ That if you hear the verses of Allah Azza wa Jal being mocked, being disrespected, right? Do not sit with them until mm. they speak about something else. And then Allah says that you are like them if you sit with them. Why are you like them? Because mm. if I'm sitting in a setting and people are mocking, let's say, Brother Rami here, uh, he's very handsome, so they're not going to mock him, right? But let's say, for example, they you know, mock him, brother Rami, and I'm sitting there, I'm not speaking. That is a form of me agreeing with what they're doing, right or wrong? I'm agreeing <laughs> with it. I'm accepting it. Because if I do actually care, I would say, no, 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 he didn't. Do don't talk about him behind his back. Don't say this about him. So if I'm sitting in a setting in which people are mocking Allah uh, and the Messenger, Allah, I'm not speaking. I'm, I'm a part of it. I'm like them. There's no difference in the sin. That's what it means. The verse in Nakum Idam Mithlum that you all have the same sin as them. Wow. You'll have the same. It's not a joke. You're sitting on they're mocking Allah and the Messenger. So mm -hmm. you will have to basically, from your experience in da'wah, you'll engage with the initial initial stage, you'll deal with them based on their apparent. And then in the end, you will decide whether they're worthy of your engagement or not. If they're not worthy, you're not going to engage with them. You weigh the harms and the benefit. This is always what you need to do as a da'i. Is there more harms or is there more benefits? Where the harms and the benefits are? And then that's why you need wisdom in the da'wah. Without wisdom, you shouldn't be doing that. 100%, 100%. And this kind of leads into my next question, which would be, what are some of the things you've learned over the years? Because wisdom is, yani, it's not something that's on or off. It's something that you gain in different categories over time, especially with Islam. So it probably takes you know a good amount of experience and understanding of people and good reading of people to be able to determine, okay, this person's completely you know insincere or not willing to listen, or to the best of my judgment, you know, I shouldn't speak with them. Uh, versus someone who is sincere, but maybe is a little rough around the edges or something. So what are some of the things you've learned over the years and have you developed you know, a wisdom for the Tao over time? Hmm. Okay, so there is there is a technical definition of, of the word wisdom uh, hmm. in, in Islam, which is al-hikmatu wadu al shay'i fi mawdai. So to, uh, wisdom is putting everything in its place in, in the right time, saying hmm. the right thing in the right time, right? Or doing the right thing in the right time, right? This is the, the general definition of wisdom, right? And then you've got the shari'i definition of wisdom, which will encompass the Quran and the Sunnah. And we need to keep that in mind now. If we got those two things together, خلاص, we, we got everything, there, right? The da'wah is perfect because if you're putting the right answers in the right time, behaving in the right way in the right time, through the wisdom, which is the Quran and the Sunnah, that's it. What else do you need? You've got the perfect now behavior that you could possibly do, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, it's a beautiful verse, Allah Azza wa Jal says, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءَ He gives wisdom to whoever who he wills. And whoever is given wisdom, he's given abundant good. So Allah Azza wa Jal chooses whom he gives the wisdom. And wisdom here can mean the Islamic knowledge. So it's, uh, Allah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi told us, if Allah loves someone, he gives him knowledge and religion. Right? So Allah chooses certain people to give, in, uh, bestow upon them knowledge, bestow upon them wisdom. Right? But in general, this is the idea of wisdom, is behaving in the right way in the right time, dealing with things in the right way in the right time, saying the right thing in the right time. I might have the information, but that person might not be ready to listen to it. He might but not be ready for me to tell it to him that way. Now, the question is, how do you understand that? It is what I think most people, unfortunately, doing da'wah in the West are missing, which is the, to be connected with the ulama. Mm. To be connected with the ulama. If you really want to know, how to deal with certain situations. If you really want to know where to gain wisdom and what wisdom is and how wisdom is implemented, you have to sit under scholars. Because they will teach you is before all of what we talked about, manners comes first. If your akhlaq is not there, doesn't matter what you spout out of your mouth. It will look filthy even if it's good because of how you behave, of how you speak, of how you engage with the people, right? So I would say da'wah is 95% manners. Even wow. if someone is a complete Islam hater, and you just behave with him in a very nice way, nice manner. And you just say, I'm, uh, I'm not going to engage with you. I apologize. I don't, um, I don't have time. I apologize. But you, you know, you're being very uh, aggressive. So if it's okay, I'm not going to engage with you. He is going to leave knowing that he's defeated. Because look, he didn't get what he wanted. He wanted to get a reaction from you. Mm. He ended up leaving with nothing. The people who will leave 
after engaging with you with good manners, are always going to leave with a good impression about Islam. And this is what we want. Our goal is to do da'wah, which is to say, to talk to the people about Islam, right? Which means we want the people to leave with a good impression about this religion. That's what we want. So manners comes first, okay? And this is, you have to sit under the, the scholars in order for you to gain uh, the manners, to understand what is the best way to deal with things. The ulama, they will teach you, you know, there was times where my, uh, I got beaten up by a scholar. This is the problem. <laughs> you, know, you get beaten up sometimes. But you, yeah, you need to be taught certain things, right? For example, uh, something so simple, like I was sitting in with one of my teachers, for example, right? We're all sitting down. I was young at that time. Say, let's say I was 19 or something like that. And I and then you got people sitting there. You got the older people. They put chair, a chair. So I come and I put a chair and I sit down. So then the sheikh, he said to me, why are you sitting down? Why are you? Something as simple as that. You're young. You're 19 years old. You should sit in your feet. You shouldn't be sitting on a chair. Okay, that old person who's 60, 70, he can't sit on a chair. He's, he's got a problem. But you, why are you sitting so relaxed in a... In, in, some, in, a, in a gathering of knowledge in which mm. you need to have haiba. Knowledge needs to have its respect and honor. Needs to have, wow. not the individual, but knowledge mm. has to have the atmosphere of respect and honor if you're sitting in a sitting of knowledge. You're not sitting playing games. You cannot be looking left and right and playing. You have to be 100% focused. And this is the deen of Allah Azza wa being taught. Right? So this, these kind of things you cannot pick up from books. You cannot pick up from books. That's why the poet, he said, يَظُنُّ الْغُمُرُ the amateurs, they think that books can lead someone to understand the sciences, but they don't, right? You cannot just by reading a book understand how to implement the knowledge and the ulum, and you cannot be guided in, into real understanding without the ulama. That's why the ulama are what are warathatul anbiya. We all know this hadith, we hear about this hadith, that the, the scholars are the inheritance of the prophets. They are the connection, they are the people who inherited the knowledge from the Prophet ﷺ. If I want a part of the inheritance, there is only one way to get it, which is through the scholars. It's not through the books. It's through the ulama. So you need to connect as much as you can with the ulama. You need to listen to them, gain knowledge from them, understanding from them. And through them, you will understand because you will see how they answer questions. You will see how they deal with the people. Like the Prophet ﷺ, he was the best teacher who was a better teacher than him. When a man came to him, He's fasting and he said, uh, sorry, can I kiss, can I kiss my, my wife when I'm fasting? He said to him, no. And the other person came, he said to him, yes. And then we understand from that, that you give one answer to one person, you give another answer based on his situation. One has a strong desire, the other person can control his desire. So because he can control his desire, he can kiss his wife when he's fasting. There's no problem. It's not going to go forward. The other person, he can't. So it's two mm -hmm. different answers to the same question. So this is given the right answer in the right time based on the situation, right? And we learned that the best from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Wow, SubhanAllah. That is, I think that is very beautifully put. And I think it's kind of multifaceted because I, I've tried to read, you know, some of these, uh, some of the books, whether it be like Usul Al-Fiqh or Ilmul Hadith or yeah, a lot of this stuff, not only is it confusing, but you open up the doors for your for yourself to confuse yourself about it, you know, to not understand it. You think it means one thing, but it means something completely different. Absolutely. So not only not only is there the aspect uh, which you you very beautifully explained, which is the wisdom and, and how you explain things to people and and exactly how much you give them, right? It's kind of like baking sometimes. You don't want to put too much salt. You don't want to put too much sugar, kind of thing, right? But there's also you yourself misunderstanding what's in the books. Because how do you even know you have the capacity to really understand it? So I think the points you made, bro, are, are beautiful. And I actually wanted to play a clip for us and for the audience. Uh, just 60 seconds of you giving dawah to the brother. Now, I won't spoil anything before I put it up. My heart, one, exploded, but also melted when I saw this video. Uh, but I think, inshallah, the people will understand once I put it up. While I'm grabbing it, do any of the brothers want to jump in quickly? Yeah, so there's two quick super chats that I did want to address, but I think Anil has a point. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, brother, if, what if someone does not have access to the ulama? What if they live in an area where they just don't have that access? Mm. Then that's a very excellent question. And it's an issue in the West. It's a huge issue in the West as a, it's in comparison to some countries where you have Islam, right? First, we've got one option called Hijra, right? That option is available for anyone to do permissible it's very rec recommended if you're going to seek knowledge so that is that is one option that i would say to people who are serious about seeking knowledge is that you do hijra and you sit under the feet of the scholars the, the feet of the ulama, right just like you see people for dunya purposes they leave their countries 
women, girls, little girls go without mihrab to kufar countries to learn about dunya. Right? And their parents let them go for dunya purposes. Oh. So the deen is the most important thing. It is more worthy of a person traveling to a different country and sitting down and learning. It has to be taken serious. Right? So I would say the best method, I would say, there's no doubt, is to go sit down under the scholars, learn the language and understand the religion the best way. This is the, my, the most recommended option I would give, right? Which is the hijrah. Right. Second thing is to try your best to connect to the students of knowledge and uh, students of knowledge in the West who connect, are connected to the scholars. Mm -hmm. That's the, the best second thing you can do. So you've got certain people in the West. They are well known to be connected to the scholars. They travel to uh, they translate videos to the scholars. They travel to Medina, to Mecca, to Yemen, to Egypt, wherever they travel. And they always engage with the ulama. They have the numbers. If there is any queries, they can engage with them. Right. So that's the best second thing you can do is to be around those students of knowledge, gain knowledge from them, learn from them, and and then uh, online try to learn as much as you can from the scholars. That's that's what you can mm. do, right? But nothing is equal to sitting down and learning. This is the truth. Nothing is going to be like that, right? So even Bukhari, so, uh, uh, Bukhari radiallahu anhu in his book. He put a chapter and he said the virtue of the person present over the person who is not present in the setting of knowledge. They're not equal. Sheikh Saleh al-Usaymi, hafizahullah, when he finished his, his uh, matin, the ending of the reading, he said, uh, he closed all of the, he said, we're not going to do bath, we're not going to do this online, it's going to be only for the people who are present. Because the people who are present are not equal to the people who are not present. They need to, give, to be given more virtue because they came here, they sat down and they learned the knowledge. Right? Today we're very lazy. We want to do Zoom, Zoom everything, you know, mm -hmm. just Zoom this meeting. No, no, no. We have to sit down because in Zoom I cannot teach you, but I can teach you when you're sitting in front of me. Mm. Wow. I got two questions. All right. So the first one is in regards to the ulama, like where can you best find these scholars? Is there a specific country that you're referring to? No, the ulama are, are there's a lot of ulama in different countries, right? So mm -hmm. you've got ulama which are not controversial, and you've got ulama which you might find someone who's got issues with them. My advice is always to stay away from controversial people in general, right? That's what I advise people to do. If someone is very controversial, they just don't be wa wasting your time listening to him. Just mm -hmm. stick with the people who are avoiding controversy, focusing on the deen of Allah Azza wa the most, before they, they just bickering and fighting with, with other people, right? But you've got ulama, you've got very well-known, recognized people, and, and you've got people in different countries. It depends on the country, right? So you've got ulama in, for example, Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti in, in, uh, in Mauritania, and his book, Al-Bayan, it's a, it's, he's one of the biggest ulama that, that we, we recently had, right? So uh, Sheikh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shanqiti, for example, he used to memorize a thousand line of poetry from every science. He used to memorize the full dictionary of Lisan al-Arab. You know, it's, it's volumes, right? Lisan al-Arab is the, one of the most voluminous dictionaries of the Arabic language. He used to memorize all of it. He used mm. to memorize the full tafsir of, uh, of Al-Qurtubi. Right? And he used to just recollect it to his memory when he's teaching his students. And the sheikh is just 50 years ago or something. I'm not talking about someone like 1,500 years before. I'm talking about someone recent. He died recently, rahimahullah, right? So it just depends on the region or in where you're such. You got Sheikh Muqbil in, uh, uh, in, in, in Yemen. Mm. He's very well known, very well known alim, scholar, who is a muhaddith, who is a big muhaddith. You got ulama in, in Egypt. You've got ulama in, uh, in, in Saudi Arabia. You've got ulama. It depends on in the country, right? You've got ulama, major ulama in Morocco, like Sheikh Ibn Khubza, rahimahullah, he died recently. He was one of the biggest teachers of the ulama. Problem is we're, so, we're too distant from the ulama. That's why you don't think they're there. But there are many ulama. There are many ulama mm. and there are many teachers and there are many very... Look, some of the ulama, subhanAllah, he just... Some of the dreams I have is just to sit with them. That's it. Just sit down and listen. That's it. <laughs> Nothing else. I don't want anything else. Right? So mm. one of my favorite ulama today, uh, in, I would say in Saudi Arabia specifically, you've got Sheikh Saleh al-Usaymi. is one of my favorite scholars today and alongside when it comes to aqidah issues detail aqidah issues is sheikh uh, salih abdul aziz sandi yeah so those two ulama are very very like they are, their levels are higher than a lot of other people right if when it comes to to the level of knowledge and understanding and memorization of, of the religion and eloquence of speech and how to deal and wisdom and all of that they, they've got things about them that you a lot of people don't have mm. right? so, also sheikh saeed al-kamali in, in morocco 
It's mm-hmm. very, very beautiful. A lot of knowledge you can get from Sheikh Saeed al-Kamal in Morocco. Bismillah, mashallah. Uh, and obviously, some people have got some issues with him. You've got those people who've got issues with every scholar out there, you know. But generally, yeah. Sheikh this, Saeed al-Kamal. Bro, bro yes. Muhammad, this, this, this begs the question that, like, how do we, not to interrupt you, but how do we know how to discern the good scholars from the, the ones that are slightly deviant or preaching something that isn't correct aqidah or something like that for a layman? Because for someone with a little bit more foundational knowledge, they will be able to tell what is who. But most vast majority of people, they might not be able to tell. Yeah. Uh, okay, there's a few things there. First thing I would say, you cannot tell anything unless you gain knowledge first. Right? When you are a jahil, you cannot... How, if you are a jahil yourself, if you're ignorant, how can you tell who is knowledge and who is not knowledge? You you know? mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you first you have to gain the knowledge. And then through the knowledge, you can distinguish between the knowledgeable and the ignorant. So if you ask in a layman to, det- to determine, they cannot do it. That's the answer, right? What a layman can do is first is what the most important thing he does dua to Allah Azza wa to guide him to the correcting the straight, right? The second thing that layman does is that he understands that a alim is a alim only with the Quran and Sunnah. And I want you to, to keep that very, very important point in mind. If you see someone says, my opinion, I think this is this, this is that, this is... And you don't hear him saying, the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah Azzawajal said, that's not considered a alim from our perspective. He's not a, a scholar. Allah Azzawajal says the Quran, بَلْ هُوَ آيَاتٌ بَيُّنَاتٌ فِي صُدُورِ الَّذِينَ أُتُوا الْعِمْ It is clear verses in the hearts of those people of knowledge. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ The ones who fear Allah. Are the scholars so you've got those people who fear Allah they got a combination between they always say Quran and Sunnah and their apparent is khushu and taqwa and prayer and worshipping Allah so they're combining these two things right so whenever they speak they say Allah said and the messenger said those are the people look I challenge anyone today for example to find one video one lecture of Sheikh Saleh al-Usami where he doesn't say Allah said and the messenger said one lecture I'll give you in what you want <laughs> find one lecture where he does not mention Quran and Sunnah Right, and I would say repeatedly, not once or twice. Repeatedly, you will see the Sheikh every couple of words. He's the Prophet Allah Azza wa said. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Uh, then he goes to the Sahaba. Umar bin Khattab said. Abdullah bin Abbas said. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said. Then he goes to the second level. Tabi'in Mujahid said. Qatada said. Then he goes to Tabi'in Tabi'in. Right, step by step. Then then he says Sufyan Tawri said. You know Sufyan Nuhayn said. Abdullah bin Mubarak. Then he goes to the next level. Imam Ahmad said the Shafi'i. And you will see them quoting those Salaf that we we talk about. The Salaf are not just. Uh, something we, we say salaf, salaf. No, salaf is to actually listen and learn what they said. You have in your, in your memory what they how they used to view the dunya, how they used to view the akhirah, the knowledge that they had. You have it in your memory and you quote them when you speak. This is the person that is a person of knowledge, right? So what you do is you look for the alim because Allah Azza is in the Quran. Fas'alu ahl dhikri as the people of dhikr. And dhikr is Quran and sunnah. So the people that Allah commands you to ask are the people of the Quran and Sunnah. The people who will say Allah said and the Messenger said. When you ask him, can I do this? He says to you, yes, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this. And that. Or Allah Azza says this and this and the Quran. Right? And you go, you find the person you trust, you see he's most knowledgeable, trusted. He's not controversial, as I said. First, you make dua to Allah Azza wa Second, the person is not an, inter- an, an a controversial individual. Right? Third, mm-hmm. he's only speaking using the Quran and Sunnah. And you can see if uh, uh, of his righteousness, his righteousness is outward, is apparent to the people, right? This is a general criteria for you to follow and listen to someone. And mm-hmm. alhamdulillah, Allah Azza wa Jal, look, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَالَّذِينَ جَهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُّلَنَا Those who struggle for us will guide them our ways. Don't think yeah. that Allah will leave you lost. It doesn't exist. It, it's impossible. If you make dua to Allah, if you're sincere, if you look, Allah will connect you with the right people. He will bestow upon you the blessing of connecting you with the people that you need to listen to and learn from right our issue is we want to listen to the controversial people yeah because they are the ones who get mm. clicks yeah. if you're a scholar you don't get clicks you know if, you, if you're controversial you get clicks if you're fighting with the, this brother and the brother is fighting with that brother and he's refuting this person he's refuting the uncle of that person, you want to click on that the people are the problem they want to click in that they want to watch that they're not valuing the knowledge yeah and you've got mm. harun and rashid and you've got imam malik when he said to him, come, he said to Imam Malik, and I want you to listen about it. Look, Harun Rashid is from the, from the lineage of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was Khalifa to Al-Muslimin. He was the Khalifa. He was Wali Al-Amr. If you put it in, in, in this term, he was the highest status person on earth at the time for Muslims. Right? And then he said to Imam Malik, come and read Muatta for me. 
Do you know what Imam Malik said? Hmm. He said, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, I have not read al-Muatta since so and so. Meaning people come read on me. I don't go read on people. <laughs> you know? People hmm. come and they read the Muatta on Imam Malik. Imam Malik doesn't go read. Right? So then he, the next step he said to him, he needs to come to the mosque. Sorry, uh, Harur, she said to him, let's go do it in the mosque. Or, sorry, no, no, apology. He said, come do it in my presence. So come, so I can hear the motta in my presence. So then Imam Malik said something very important. He said, this knowledge cannot be only for the elites. It has to be for everyone. So you have to do it in the mosque. So then Harun Rashid had to go to Imam Malik to listen. And he is, I'm telling you, the highest status person on earth, right? That the Prophet ﷺ said, you have to obey your, your wali, uh, wali, uh, wali al-amr. He's a righteous person from the, the lineage of the Prophet ﷺ, but he still told him that. Why did Imam Malik, say, Imam Malik say that? An ignorant person would say that's arrogant. But an, 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 a person who understands, a person of knowledge will say, he is giving you the value of knowledge. Nothing surpasses knowledge. Knowledge has a value above everything else. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter who you are. You have to humble yourself for the deen of Allah Azza Mm. So this is the mentality that we need all need to have with the deen of Allah Azza So brother, at one point you were mentioning the thing about presence And you were saying there was a difference between someone who's sitting and listening to knowledge Who's present and who's not present But how does one actually be more present in these situations? Mm -hmm. Because I know a lot of people have difficulties when it comes to this uh, it will come back to what we said in the beginning. Uh, uh, anyways, right? It's the idea of seeking knowledge. Is that through the hijra or being with the students of knowledge? So, so you have to be present in the gather gatherings of knowledge. There's only two ways. Either you travel to the gathering of knowledge. Oh, no, no, no. Habibi, Habib. I mean, like, mentally. Mm -hmm. Mentally present. Like, sitting down no, and they're, okay, like, they're, they're listening ah, okay. to the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, then, yeah, 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 now yeah. I get what you're saying now. Okay. How to be mentally present. This is something you have to train your nafs to do. You have mm -hmm. to train your nafs to do. It's not something that will come one day. You go, you push away every distraction out there. That's why the problem some people want to learn about Islam, they do it on their phone. Watching a, a lecture and then notification, okay, let me check this WhatsApp match. Okay, let me check this tweet. Let me retweet this. And then you come back to the video, you go back. And there's no benefit from it, right? If you want to focus on something, you have to give 100% reflection towards that thing. Nothing else. You focus on that thing, right? And you bring, as the Salaf used to say, you bring your, your weapons, which is the pen and paper. We don't just listen. You have to write down the important information. You have to put effort. You have to read and revise. Read and revise. Push yourself to be sitting down there, listening. If you feel like you're, you're getting dizzy, you, you wake up yourself, you focus, right? Seeking knowledge is not a, like a, a taking a nap. You have to put effort. That's why the people of knowledge are not equal to the people who don't have knowledge. Say those who know and those who don't know are not equal. Mm -hmm. Those of, of intellect, they, they reflect on this. The, the people of knowledge are not equal to the people of no knowledge. So in order for you to gain knowledge, you will have to put effort. Abdullah ibn Abbas is a beautiful example. He used to be young and he used to go seek knowledge, listen to the, to the Sahaba and learn from the Sahaba. right? And then the other youngsters, because Abdullah ibn Abbas was very young, they said to him, come, let's play. He said, no, no, no. And he used to go and he used to seek knowledge. And he used to go knock on the doors. And then the people say to him, oh, oh, cousin of the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, don't you just tell me, I will come to you. You are the cousin of the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I will come teach you. You don't have to come all the way to my door. He said, no. And he used to come and seek knowledge. Then that same person that said to him, come, let us do something else. Let us play. He said, I saw everyone around Abdullah ibn Abbas learning. Later on, when Abdullah ibn Abbas became older in age, after he got that knowledge that he was spending when he was young, for leaving, playing and messing around and wasting time on video games and all of the stuff, Right? When he focused on seeking knowledge, he ended up being the, pe the person that people come to to seek knowledge. Mm. Right? So it is that, trying to put as much focus as you can. And uh, wallahi, don't forget the dua. I'll always mention the dua. Dua is very important. Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who shows us the guidance. We, don't, we, mm. we, we just need to ask Allah Azza wa Jal. If we have sincere intention, we put the effort, you can do anything you put your mind to. Anything halal. Do you have any practical secrets for making dua aside from tahajjud? The main important thing is to avoid the the dua, where the prevent the things that prevents your dua from being accepted. Like for instance, the eating haram, right? Cutting the, the ties of uh, of family. 
these things can be sins in general can be a means for your dua not to be not to be accepted right so you have to stay away from from sins as much as you can as much as possible uh, obviously no one is going to be perfect but avoiding those main sins that prevent your dua from being mm -hmm. accepted and then also keep in mind that you need to have an attentive heart when you're making the dua because of the hadith of the prophet ﷺ, that allah does not accept the dua of someone with qalbin lahim distracted heart if your heart is distracted when you're making dua to allah azza then allah is not going to accept that type of dua you go your mind is somewhere else and you're just saying words yeah you have to mm -hmm. be very attentive and do dua in the last third of the night. It mm -hmm. is the time where Allah Azza wa Jal descends. Specifically to answer your call. Allah himself, the Lord of the Alameen, the Lord of the world, comes down and he says, Oh my servant, ask me, I will give you. Request from me, I will give you. What else do you want? SubhanAllah, we need to understand that last third of the night, and you have Ramadan today, you know, that last third of the night, make dua. And understand, that Allah Azza wa Jal, like the Prophet Sallallahu told us, Allah will accept your dua as long as you're not hasty. Your dua is accepted in different forms. First, it can, let's say you ask for money. The money can be delayed. It's not coming instantly. It can come after 10 years, 20 years, because it's not good for you today. Allah knows what's good for you and he will give it to you when he thinks it's good for you. Mm. Right? Your dua might be delayed to the afterlife. It might raise your status in paradise. Or it might be a means for you to, for your sins to be elevated. So dua can be accepted in different ways. It's not necessarily that what you ask for, you get. Because Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, you might love something and it is bad for you. And you might hate something and it is good for you. Allah knows and you do not know. Allah knows and we do not know. So if Allah doesn't give me something, Allah wants good for me. If he didn't give it to me, then that mm -hmm. thing is not really good for me. If Allah so gives it to me in a specific time, then it's good for me. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, Allahumma barik. So I think Brother Rami has a video pulled up. I don't want to go on too long of a tangent, but I just had a question right now, so I got to ask you. Um, generally, I'm not looking for a fatwa, but a lot of brothers that live in the West, you, you spoke about, you know, expiating sins or removing sins for duas to not be rejected. And a lot of brothers are unfortunately eating haram meat. And they think that it's not pork, but it's okay. You can say, Bismillah, we live in a Christian country. So, you know, if you live in a Christian country, like, you know, America, Canada, UK, then we can eat chicken and beef that's not halal certified or you don't have to check. So what are your views on that? Well, first, we, we, we disagree with this terminology of saying this is a Christian country. If, according to the last census in the UK, uh, Christians are less than 50% of the population. <laughs> and those Christians that are less than 50% of the population in the UK are not really Christians. They don't go to the church and believe in their book. It's just a form that you get when you get home, they just click Christian, you know, because they're born in a Christian society. So they don't really believe in Christianity, right? So when first we disagree with this idea that this is a Christian country, right? Number two, let's take the assumption that it is a Christian country. Let's say, okay, it is a Christian country. Even if you're a Muslim, if you do not slaughter the meat and you electrocute it, it's haram for you to eat, even from a Muslim. It doesn't matter if it's a Christian country or not. If mm -hmm. the meat is not slaughtered, it is not halal, it's maita. Allah Azza explicitly says in the Quran, chapter 5, verse 3, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةُ وَالدَّمُ وَلَحْمُ الْخِنْزِيرِ وَمَا أُهِلَّ لِغَيْرِ اللَّهِ بِهِ So Allah mentions the different types of meat that are haram. And this mayta, this dead meat that you're eating, is haram even if a Muslim is the one who electrocuted the meat. Mm. Even if he mentions the name of Allah, it doesn't matter. The meat, has, you need to do the zakah of the meat. You need to actually slaughter the meat. Slaughter the dhabiha. And today they don't do this. So whether we accept, even if you want to lie and say it's a Christian country, it's not a Christian country. They do not slaughter the meat. And therefore you're eating atheist meat, right? That is, is being electrocuted. And it is not good for you. Yani Allah wants good for you, you don't want good for yourself. You're eating meat where the body remains and uh, the blood remains in the body after the death and all of the germs and the bacteria and everything remains in the body. And you're eating that meat which is unhealthy for you. Allah is making something healthy and good for you and you're avoiding it to eat mm. from something which is haram. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, the person raises his hand is dua. وَمَأْكَلُهُ حَرَامُ وَمَشْرَبُهُ حَرَامُ وَمَلْبَسُهُ حَرَامُ His clothing is haram, his eating is, is haram, his drinking is haram. فَأَنَّ يُسْتَجَابُ لَهُ How does he expect Allah to answer his, his dua? If you're eating haram, how do you expect Allah Azza wa Jal to answer the dua that you're making, right? So, they are, in, in countries like here in the UK, there are very good organizations, like for example, HMC. Halal meat certificate HMC here in the UK. The very they are very uh, they do very very extensive checks 
very diligent one and they make sure that the actually it's slaughtered and it's weekly and they make sure this is being slaughtered in an Islamic way. You can eat from that. It's more expensive. So people tend to buy from other meats, right? They don't want to buy this one. They buy from other ones. But it is there and you can eat halal meat in the UK. There's no problem, right? But eating the other types of meat that are doubtable and this and that in a, in, in a country like the UK today or these countries that are no longer... Yeah, it is meat, right? And these, country, these countries are no longer Christian countries to begin with. Mm. It's an excuse that people make to eat at McDonald's, you know? Right. And let alone what the ramifications are on a spiritual level that we, that's in the unseen. We're not even aware of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and subhanAllah, uh, Allah says, وَمَا لَكُمْ أَن لَا تَأْكُلُوا مِمَّا ذُكِرَ اسْمُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَقَدْ فَصَّلَ لَكُمْ مَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمْ Why are you not eating? Allah is asking. From what Allah, the meat that Allah's name was mentioned upon. And he's deta detailed to you that which is haram to avoid. Right? And then Allah says that the, the awliya of the shayateen, they try to entice you from eating haram. They try to push you into eating haram. You know? They try to stop you from eating the meat that is permissible, that is that Allah Azza wa has given you that you can eat. And subhanAllah, when, when Surah Al-Ma'idah, the verse that I mentioned, when, when Allah Azza wa mentioned the things that are haram, because they were asking what types of things are haram, the next verse, then it says, what is halal? They ask you what was made halal for them. So then Allah says, everything good is made halal. Because he cannot enumerate what Allah Azza wa allowed you to eat. Allah allowed you to eat all types of fish. Allah allowed you to eat cows. Allah allowed you to eat lamb. Allah allowed you to eat camel meat. Allah allowed you to eat horse meat. List is, is, is not as unstoppable. Allah stopped you from some mm -hmm. things. That you need to avoid. So Allah, the good are many. The halal is a lot. But people focus on that which Allah Azza wa Jal made impermissible. Yeah. Beautifully said. Allah Yeah, that's a very Ram, good bro. point. You want to play the video? Yeah, yeah, inshallah. That's a very inshallah. good point. A lot of people, subhanAllah, they, they want to focus on things they can't have. And I think that's mm. that's almost something that's almost a liberalistic principle. You know, go for what you want. And a lot of the time people want what they can't have. So, <laughs> yani. It, they're they're really really enticed to uh, to want to do uh, things that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala prohibited, but yani, it goes back to what you said. It's it's really about one sincerity and two, it's about knowledge. It's about knowing and understanding why you're going to obey this command. It's not just that you have to not eat meat because that's it. You just don't. It's because the most knowledgeable, the most wise, the most high, the one who created you and the meat and the universe and everything in it, has told you not to eat it, and he doesn't say anything. Uh, except that it's it's what's best for us uh, as you mentioned before so I think that's a very beautiful point but with that being said inshallah I do have the video I'm going to pull it up right now bismillah so we need Sharia law yeah <laughs> stoning is for men and women I don't know where you get this idea of women it's a punishment that applies to men and women can you tell me the dangers of adultery it's terrible it wrecks families when, when families are wrecked what happens children become dysfunctional when children become dysfunctional what happens crimes yeah, it was killing, yeah. raping, yeah. stealing men so adultery yeah. will result in a cycle of killing the majority of criminals come from single parent homes in the West there's a book called The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell it has all of the stats that I'm telling you adultery makes single parent homes Single parent homes causes crimes and killings. Islam makes a, a law that prohibits adultery, which by one life saving thousands of lives, thousands of destructions, thousands of problems happening in society by making that law, which you, know you say you disagree you know with. What? You know what? I agree with you now. You see? You've made me change my mind. No problem. That's what I'm saying. You change your mind about it. Okay, no problem. I'm happy. I, agree with you. <laughs> I like Sharia law, yeah? And I wish they had it here. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. What? It just... Just think about that, subhanAllah. The guy in the beginning came with a normal misconception and he left saying, we need Sharia Allah. We should have it here, subhanAllah. Uh, my first question is, how the heck did you do that? Like, what was that, subhanAllah? <laughs> he surprised me, subhanAllah. And he said that you want Sharia Allah. <laughs> because I was asking him, so we need Sharia Allah. I said, yeah, we need Sharia Allah, subhanAllah. <laughs> well, like, it's, it's when the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal is presented to the people, any sincere individual has no choice but to accept. Mm. Right? When the, the, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ultimate wisdom of Allah, especially for people that have seen the opposite, because he's the type of people, uh, he's one of the people who've seen the opposite in his country. He's, he's seen when that law is not applied, what do you have? So I don't need to convince him that if you don't do that, that will be bad because he's already seen the opposite, right? So half the, the, half the job is done already. All I need to do is to explain the wisdoms behind that specific act that Allah Azza wa says that we should do and why it is ultimate wisdom. And again, it comes back to the idea of the ulama. They, they tell us about these issues. They tell us that Allah Azza wa Jal, when he commands the killing of a life, 
it is to save hundreds of lives in return. It is not to kill that life or to end that life, but it is to save other lives in return in the end, mm. right? So when people put that mind and put that concept in their mind and understand it fully, then the message of Islam is, yeah, and subhanAllah, there's nothing more beautiful than it, you know? And we need to, to be, we need to ourselves understand these things so we don't become uh, apologetic, quote unquote, and try to uh, twist the religion and change the teachings in order for us to appease and please these people when they come to us with these types of misconceptions. We need to be able, as we said, to have the defensive that the Sheikh was, was talking about is to explain, to clear, clarify the shubuhat. And these shubuhat, that, I'll tell you something, there is no shubuhat that someone can come with except that you can use as evidence for Islam. Now keep that in mind. There is no doubt or a criticism someone can bring against Islam except that you can use that same thing to show how Islam is unique, how Islam is beautiful, how Islam is from God. Right? You just need to know how to use it, which way you need to use it. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Wow. Yeah, subhanAllah. I mean, that, that clip, I think there's a lot going on there. So there is, I think, um, uh, a level of understanding of who this person is, what he's been through. Like you mentioned, it's all around him. And he seemed to be very aware, actually, because when you ask the question, and I think that's what's really important, that we, we look to understand each individual as an individual. You ask him a question. He didn't just give a cookie-cutter answer. He said, what happens? He said, oh, it wrecks families. That's the first box checked okay what happens when families are wrecked you walked him down that path and i think that's so beautiful um all while you know having good manners there are people out there that yani they might have done it in an arrogant way you know like look at your people look what happened to your people you know that's mm -hmm. in instantly distinguishing yourself from them in a way that yani is putting them bad and try almost seeming arrogant so how important is is mannerisms and more specifically what mannerisms can you point out that make a big difference with dawah? Hmm. Okay. So uh, I, I gave like this, this I listen as well. I was given this lecture for the people who are in my charity of how to do dawah, this and that. And I mentioned to them something very important. The first thing you need to do in the dawah, I said, is you need to do what I called, what I labeled for them is you need to do a diagnosis. Someone is coming to you with a disease. It's not a medical disease. It's a heart disease. If he's not a Muslim, he's got a disease, straight up. If he's Muslim struggling with sins, he's got a disease in his heart, right? So uh, people are coming to you with diseases. As a da'i, you need to be able to diagnose the person. Based on the diagnosis, your approach comes. The, the problem is some people have this programmatic approach with everyone. No. Based on the person, based on diagnosing him, based on seeing how someone who's not a PhD holder, I don't need to start giving him philosophical jargon for no reason confusing the guy but he doesn't even know what i'm talking about he, the discussion ends but he just left confused right we need to see who we're dealing with and we need to speak to them based on their level of understanding okay so the first thing let's say in the mannerisms is understanding the person in front of us a bit of empathy is needed right empathy is necessary you need to put yourself in their shoes you need to put yourself in their position if they're coming asking you a question that you might get offended by First, you need to understand in your mind that he didn't live like you. He didn't live as a Muslim. He was not born as a Muslim. He didn't have people answering his question. He's born in a society in which taught him that this is the reality. Based on that, you put yourself in his shoes. You have empathy with him. Right? Second thing is, uh, what I would say, is the most important thing. Listen more than you talk. <laughs> unless, unless you are invited to talk, which means that the other person wants to listen. So if the other person is not, you don't see that he wants to ask a question. If you see any movement that he wants to speak, you, you stop straight away and let him speak. doesn't matter what you're saying. Stop, keep the idea, and then speak after he puts his point forward. Because he will, you will make him comfortable. You will make him put his guard down. You will make him understand that you are here sincerely caring about him. You don't, you don't just want to push this down my throat like some religions do and then leave. So it's very important, very necessary to listen more than you talk, to listen a lot, to attentively listen. I'm not just saying, yeah, shake your head and then you just, you know, actually understand what the person is saying, right? So attentively listen, never get angry, never get angry, never mm. become upset, and never retaliate with bad words or evil, evil manners. Never do that. If you're patient, you listen, you diagnose the person. And you've got what you call the, uh, the, the, the things that are necessary for given da'wah we said in the beginning of this podcast, you should be fine. Well, I don't think you need Allah. anything else. Yeah, and it's question, question. If, if you, okay, you said the diagnosis, but 
how can one properly diagnose someone who's coming to them if they're too excited? You I, or them? I'll be honest. The person is excited. Again. Who's no, excited? No, the, you or the, the person? The is excited. Okay. He's too excited <laughs> to give the dawah. <laughs> yes. So and that's how can the, you diagnose? Yes. So, so that would mean you need to put yourself in a calm, composed position in order for you to... Look, you need to have a grip over your emotions if you're going to do that. That's why I said you cannot get angry. That your emotions must be in your control. I'm not saying don't feel them. I'm saying you don't display them. There's a difference between the two. I, you can be offended, but you cannot display that yourself being offended to the people. You, cannot, you might get angry by, by an action. You cannot display that to the people. You have to learn to suppress those types of emotions. And Allah Azza when he spoke about the muttaqeen, he said, وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَ It's a beautiful, beautiful verse, which you, you cannot really put in English, you know? <laughs> but وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْضَ it's, it's a way of like suppressing غيض, which is like serious anger. They is suppressing it. And those who pardon the people, right? Allah, Allah, Allah loves the muhsineen, right? You have to be like that. You have to have this level of self-control. So you're excited. Don't let your excitement ruin your mission. You're excited because yeah. you want to do good. You cannot make the excitement ruin the goal that you want to do, which is to invite them to Islam. Try yeah. to, and look, the more that way you do, the more you will get this idea of uh, as you said the diagnosis as well it's very important you need to ask questions in order for you to diagnose it's through asking questions through listening that's why i say listening is very important because through someone's words you can learn a lot about them. through mm -hmm. what that person says you can learn a lot about them right so all you need to do is to listen 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 and you need to engage with the people in a respectful manner and you need to suppress your own kind of emotions you don't just display them in mm -hmm. in, in the wrong way and by the way look the face tells it all right so you might be angry suppressing it, but your face is like, you want to eat the best. Mm. That's not what we want, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you, want, you have to keep the right expressions where people don't actually like feel like intimidated by you. Alhamdulillah. Okay, another question. When you're giving dawah, and let's say you've got your emotions in check, and let's say you're diagnosing them, how do you know when to stop? How do you know when enough is enough and, and you have to pull back now and stop giving them? Or else it's just going to overload them. Okay, I'll give you two easy point, two easy ways. One, when person when person denies observable realities, I'll give an example. When I say to someone, "Okay, this is a building," and he says, "No, no, no, this is not a building." <laughs> we go, we come to this. I come to this level all the time. You'd be surprised. There are many people, do you? I don't exist. You don't exist. The table doesn't. Nothing exists. Nothing. You, you when you come to this level in which things are very basic and they are rejecting it. Then, okay, that's a red flag. You know straight away that person is not really engaging on an intellectual level. <laughs> Number two, when they are repeatedly contradicting themselves. They say something. Mm -hmm. After a few minutes, they come and they uh, contradict what they said. Which means now they're arguing for the sake of arguing. Mm -hmm. So they're not noticing w what positions they're putting forward because they're not thinking about them. They're just throwing it at you because they're arguing with you. So they just throw mm -hmm. whatever comes in their mind. And therefore, they will always contradict themselves. So when you start in your mind pointing out the contradictions that he said, don't do this. And two minutes later, he said, but other people are doing this. You get what I'm trying to say? You start to see these repeated contradictions. They know, okay, that person is just arguing for the sake of arguing. Mm. This is no, there's no longer time for me to, I'm not going to waste my time anymore. There you go. This is a pack for you. Thank you for your time. But what if it's neither of the two? What if they're just listening to you? And you're just like, yeah, like this, this guy is taking it. Like, let me give him some more. Let me give him some more. Like, how do you know when to stop? I, I, I don't think this will ever happen. If someone is not sincere, he cannot listen. It's impossible. If I'm coming and I'm not sincere, I cannot just let you speak, speak, speak about something that I don't like, that I don't care about, that I don't want to hear about. Mm. This is torture for him, you know? If, if he doesn't, want, doesn't like it, doesn't want to hear about it, and you keep talking about it, Allah Azza wa created and he sent the messenger, and he's silent and he's listening, that means he's got an interest in listening to, to what, you, what you want to say. Right, mm. unless there is other signs, like a person is of a, a specific group that you know that those people are extreme Christians that they always try to come waste your time, then you ignore them. But general public, they're not going to listen to you because look, time is valuable, and we as human beings, we value our time. We don't sit down and listen for long periods of time to something to so, about something to listen about, to something that we don't care about, especially mm. with the time uh, span and the time attention span that we have today because of this generation. <laughs> They're not, they're not going to sit down and listen to you. Trust me. No one is going to sit down and listen 
to hear about something they don't like, they don't want to hear about. Just to waste your time. They're not going to do that. And always know you're rewarded. You judge the apparent. So if the apparent is good, you continue to speak because every word you say, Allah is rewarding you for it. You mm. get your, your job done. The, the goal is not the shahada. The goal is delivering the message. Alhamdulillah. 100%. So let's let's address these uh these four chats. Uh, first one, brother asks, "Assalamu alaikum, brothers." My eye itches a lot, so I was wondering if I could use eye drops while fasting. I don't know, oh, man. Well, none of us are shares. <laughs> Bro, but you make wudu, and you when you make wudu, you have to. He can use it. He can use it. There's no problem. Yeah. It's oh, not. Can... It's, it's not. It's not considered food or, or drink. And mm. based on that, the ulama say it's permissible to use. And also, uh, they they use uh, a qiyas for this idea as well. And they say that if a person used to make another, he made an oath with Allah that I'm not going to eat or drink, and he put an eye drop, does he break his oath? No. Because he didn't eat or drink. So based on that, we say that this eye drop is not considered eat or drink. It does not uh, break your fast. Mm, okay. Yeah. All right, bottle coffee. Well, look at the wisdom. Look at the wisdom, man. Here I am trying to like be a, a smart, not a smart ass, but just using You're my own intellect. And Nah, bro. No, no, no. Not like this. But like you use the wisdom there and you brought like what the scholars were saying and how they deducted this reasoning. SubhanAllah. It's beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Next from Brother Wahab, I'm the winner. Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters. Give my salam to Brother Muhammad. I enjoy watching him do his thing. Allahumma barik. May Allah preserve you. Barak Allah fiq, akhi. We need to talk one day with this brother. He's a nice brother. Inshallah, we organize, Inshallah. Uh, organize something with him. Inshallah. 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 Next Inshallah. question, Inshallah. please ask him where he's from. I don't answer that question. <laughs> 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 right, this is the most common question. That's why I say I, I usually don't answer any personal questions. So uh, I, I try to avoid them as much as possible. Bro, just, just say I come from Allah and to Allah I will return, inshallah. Yeah, I usually give different answers. Sometimes I'm from my mother's womb. Sometimes I'm from, <laughs> from dust. Sometimes you know, <laughs> from Muslim's <laughs> land, you know. It depends, you know. You are the, people know I'm an Arab. And that's the important thing to know. That's it. That's enough. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Bro, what is this question, man? Are you selling beards in merch store? Did I read that right? <laughs> no, we're not selling beards, bro. Just make dua to Allah during the last third of the night, like the brother said, to grow a beard. Inshallah, ya Rab. Assalamu alaikum. Can Muhammad speak to how he has such a good memory, quoting the Bible, science books, etc.? I love you all for Allah's sake. May Allah loving you. May Allah love you for loving us for his sake. Allahumma ameen. But uh, brother Muhammad, um, how would you answer that? I would say that muscle is a memory. Sorry, memory is a muscle. Mm -hmm. Memory is a muscle. Just like you go to the gym. I'm sure you guys go to the gym, mashallah, yeah? So when <laughs> you go to the gym or you work out, because I work at home, I don't work out in the gym. If you work out, you got a muscle, what do you need to do to make that muscle stronger? You have to keep training, right? So in order for you to have good memory, you have to keep memorizing, Step by step, every mm -hmm. day you memorize, you memorize, you memorize, you revise, you memorize again, you revise, you memorize. It, it's not like someone, no, one, I don't think anyone is born with, with perfect memory. It doesn't have, it's a muscle that is always exercised. That's why this ulama that I mentioned to you, for example, from Mer Mauritania, you don't have tablets, they don't have phones, they don't have laptops. Mm -hmm. It's their memory, that's it. They have some stones that they carve on. You understand? <laughs> that's it. No papers even, no pens. So they use their memory on a daily basis. And that's why the Arabs had the strong memory that they had. They had to rely on it as a memory. So this muscle always strengthens. The more you memorize, you try to memorize the Quran, you memorize the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, you memorize the Asanid, the names of the ulama, the Salaf, etc. And the more you memorize, the more memorizing next time becomes easier for you. Alhamdulillah. The more you pick up information quickly. <clears throat> so that's what I would say. Well, so brother know, Arnold has to go, unfortunately. You got iftar. May Allah accept your fast and your du'as. Well, it's and me as well in, in, in 10 minutes. Me, me as well. <laughs> so it's not different. Uh, we'll, we'll, well, my, mine's a... Uh, you want to finish up? Or are we going to... No, no, no. You no, can go, 10 bro. minutes. Go. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, okay. I, my iftar is in like... I think one minute actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and one minute. So he's an hour ahead of you. Yeah, I listen. Yes. It was a, a blessed time. Mashallah, bro. May Allah bless you. Barakallah fiq, akhi. May Allah accept from us. Allah. I mean, I mean, inshallah, we can all speak again soon. Inshallah, inshallah. Ya Rab. 
حبيبي السلام السلام عليكم اخي بارك الله فيك السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ان شاء الله سو برو يو ونت بوت ذا اي شو سبيد كليب اند ذن وي جات ا تو سوبر تشات ثري مور سوبر تشاتس اول رايت اول رايت بسم الله ليتس دو ات كويكلي So heads up, the quality is not the greatest because uh, speed was streaming at the time, but uh, we can put up with it, inshallah. What's that over there? What's this over here? What's this? What? Do you want me to comment on it while you play, or? Yeah, if at, at any point, if you want, you can ask me to to pause it. Um, but it's only three minutes. If you want to wait to the end, inshallah, it's completely up. To okay, you. play it, play it, play it. It's better, inshallah. I don't know. What is this though? What is this? Who are you? I'm speed. You're speed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you come into troll, we don't like. No, 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 no. I'm not trolling, bro. I'm not trolling. I'm so, serious, bro. Okay. So are you are you Christian? Who me? Yeah. Under fire right now, buddy. You're undecided. Yeah. Do you believe in a creator? Yes, I do. You believe something created? The heavens. Yes, I do. I believe in God. Excellent. We believe in God too. Okay. We say our definition of the creator is not a man, is not a woman. He's not like you and me. So the creator is not a man or a woman like you and me, right? Uh -huh. There are Christians who believe that God is a man and he died on a cross. We don't believe that. Uh -huh. Believe the creator created everything. If I tell you think about a color that does not resemble any color in existence, can you do that? Red. A color that does not resemble any color in existence. A new color. Can you think about a new color? Yeah. Give me like a blackest grayish. <laughs> black, but still you're using colors that are in existence. Black and gray. Can you think about a color that does not resemble any color in existence? Uh, you limit it to your experience. Right. We say Allah is for experience as human beings. Uh -huh. Therefore, he does not resemble the creation. Right. So Allah is not a man or a, or a woman. He's not an idol. He's not a picture, but he's powerful. Uh -huh. What? Leave him. We, we have a discussion. Why you yeah. want to go away? Why are you trying to come away? Leave him. Yeah, listen. yeah, yeah. You know, no, no, no. I want to listen. I want to listen. So Allah does not resemble his creation. He's uh -huh. powerful. Right? Right. Whenever you think you have something, whenever you think you're powerful, you have to remember who brought you to this life to begin with. And you have to remember who can take your soul today, who can take your soul tomorrow, right? This is the creator in Islam. Allah created us and he's testing us in this life. I'm, I already know about Islam though. Okay. Yeah. Tell me about Islam then if you know. Oh, uh, so we so we become a Muslim, you're gonna have Four to five wives. You can't eat. <laughs> Four to five wives. You can't eat pork. Okay. You pray five times a day. Okay. Uh, the judgment of day, the uh, dig, the dig, the 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 dig, the dig, the Come on, help me out, bro. The dodge. I'm I'm feeling you're trolling. If you're no, not, I, I'm not trolling, okay. bro. I'm being serious. Bro. I, oh, and I'm being not serious too. No, so no, religion, no, no. religion for us as Muslims is a serious thing. Yeah, and I'm sure and you I know that. that. Yeah. And I'm sure you know that very well. And yeah. I'm sure people in your community know that very. Well. Yeah, we take Islam that. very serious. Bro. I get that. We don't joke around. We don't troll when it comes to Islam, right? Uh -huh. We do believe in Judgment Day. Islam does not teach that every Muslim should marry four wives. Where do you get this concept from? No. <laughs> Somebody. Some where do you, where no, do you watch I'm not this? Laughing. I'm no, serious. No, she's, she's not. She's not with us. She's not with us. She's a Christian. Woman. Don't worry about her. So where? Where does? So if you read the Quran. So if you read the Quran. And then he just gets dragged Wait, away from someone else. It looks like. So there, there's definitely a lot going on in that clip, and um, my first, my first uh, question was, you know, what, what happened? So I want to hear from your perspective. What was going on? Yes, Allah, this was like it's obviously Allah has His plans, you know. <laughs> Our plans, Allah has His plans, you know. You just, ha he just happened to walk across. I didn't even know who he was. But the point is, is in, the interesting thing we need to look at is his behavior when he's approaching the tip, right? He was the person walking and straight away the verse of the Quran came to my mind where Allah Azza says, Wala tamshi fil ardi marhan, inna ka lan al arda wa lan tablugh al jibal atula. Do not walk in the earth, boastful. You're not gonna, the earth is not gonna crack open and you're not gonna reach the height of the mountains. So you cannot be like walking like you, like you, own, you own the whole place, right? So he was walking in that way and he's coming very aggressively. And the interesting background story is this. But before I say the background story, is that he went to the brother who's talking with a sister in the, one of my brothers who's talking with a, with a woman. That woman was coming to accept Islam, right? Mm. She's ready to accept Islam. She's taking her shahad. And he came and then he embarged into the da'wah table, <laughs> jumping on the brother. And then he said, what is this? What is this? <laughs> He's like left or right. And subhanAllah, I don't know. And the interesting thing is, is that we were already kind of on the defensive anyways, because you had uh, this woman from Speaker's Corner coming with five people. 
the videos on my channel. It's one hour video. You hear her speaking in the video as well. She was there and she was coming with five people with, with cameras. So what happened, which is very funny, is that I thought Speed was a guy who goes to Speaker's Corner who looks very, very similar to him. He is, he's got the similar hairstyle and this and that. And he's a part of that group. So I thought he was coming with her. And he's coming like this. So I said, who are you? Why are you coming like interrupting the, the brother? is about to take the shadow of a sister. You're coming like, like this, right? So the first thing I said, who are you? Right? So then he said, speed. I said, okay, speed. And then I was thinking in my mind, you see me pause for a second. Is why is he joking? Is a drug? What, who's called speed, you know? So then I, I said <laughs> to him, what do you want, right? So then you see how he's speaking now. He was very aggressive in his tone, right? Calling me buddy, which is <laughs> very, very funny to be honest. But yeah, that's why in the Dawah you have to kind of ignore these things and you have to engage with the people, right? But I said, okay, Alhamdulillah, look, he's got so many people around him. I hear people laughing, some people saying troll, troll, and trolling, and this and that. So I thought he was being uh, coming to joke. So I said to him, look, first thing that we need to keep in mind is that we're not here to troll. We take our religion seriously. And we mentioned the verse of the Quran in the stream is that we are commanded not to engage with people if they're coming to joke and mess around about the religion of Islam. We have to be serious. We have to say that we're not going to engage. So I said to him, if you're coming to joke, this is not what, what we're here to do. He said, no, I'm serious. I want to learn. I said, okay, you're serious. I saw people around him. Tell me. I said, it's a chance for me to talk about just basic concepts of Islam, that Allah Azza wa is not like his creation, right? Allah sends the prophets and messengers, and we don't believe that God is a man. These main misconceptions. Mm -hmm. So I just delivered these main misconceptions. And I knew anyways, this is not a good opportunity to do the da'wah. Question is why? Is because when he came, there's already 100 ch 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 children following him. They mm -hmm. surrounded the whole table. Right. There was al already this woman there and his managers were trying to drag, drag him away to leave mm -hmm. because they saw there's so many people crowding and mm -hmm. something problem might happen. Right. So you saw in the video they were dragging him and I said, no, no, leave him to listen. Right. He wants to say he wants to listen. Let him don't don't take him away. So his managers were trying to drag him. So basically, I delivered the message. And then all of a sudden, when I'm explaining to him, he said, what is this? I want to learn. He said, look now, the, the self-contradiction that I was mentioning. He said, I want to learn. Then in mid-discussion, he said, I already know about Islam. <laughs> right? Mm. right? You see? So now I see, look, if you come into joke, look, you said you want to learn in the beginning of the discussion. Now you say you, you know about Islam. Which one is it, right? I say, okay, you know about Islam. I uh, still will exercise patience. You okay, tell me about Islam. Then he goes and says five, more five or five, four or five fives. And then he mentions this joke. So, so I said, look, mm -hmm. if you're joking, I said to you in the beginning, look, we don't joke around with Islam. We're serious. If you want to hear, we can talk to you. Then obviously that woman, she came and she said, uh, Taqiya, this crazy uh, Christian woman. Uh, and then subhanAllah, he, he thought that, that someone or someone with us or something like that. Then I said, I'm serious. I'm serious. His manager heard him uh, with a loud voice. So he probably dragged him because so many people were around and they left. Right. So this opportunity was definitely not a da'wah opportunity. You cannot give him da'wah in the environment. It's impossible. You're not going to mm. be able to do it because of the situation and how things were. And he's not going to spend a long time there. So I said, Alhamdulillah, anyways, I was able. Later on, when I found out who he was, I said, Alhamdulillah, I was able to deliver anything that maybe someone heard, that maybe someone would benefit, a, a misconception that can be moved away from the people or something that might spark something in the mind of, uh, of people when they watch the video. So that was kind of uh, the background of what happened. You know? Yeah, that's beautiful. We, we only have a few minutes and I don't want to hold you past your thought. How long do you have exactly? Like four minutes or something? Till you have to break no, it's okay. We can we can do a few minutes. It's okay. Go ahead. Because we have five super chats and... Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No problem. Any other questions? Okay. Bismillah. I'm with you. So we're going to have uh, we're going to have brother Muhammad read it. Yeah. It says, Subhanallah, Tabarak, Rahman. Yeah. So he's praising Allah Azza wa Jal, basically. Alhamdulillah. Um, Brother Raymond says, I know you said eye drops are okay, but it's chapstick. Uh, I'm fine without using it, but but for the sake of Allah, everyone looking at me, I feel bad. Okay, one, you're too insecure about your lips. Don't worry. I don't think people are that focused. He could, but... he could be a reverb, bro. He could be a reverb. He's just trying oh, to I see, I see. No worries, inshallah. Well, anything that does not get consumed into your stomach does not break your fast. But if you start using these type of things, it might be difficult for you to avoid it. So obviously the best option is not to use it. But if you can guarantee using it without swallowing any of it, because if you do, it will break your fast because it goes into your, your, your stomach. If it goes into your stomach, it breaks your fast. So that is the, that is the general criteria to make it easier for you. Mm. All right. RS says, if we want to fund Muhammad's dawah and share in the reward, how can we do so? Please consider adding Muhammad to the group and <laughs> for Muslim. Allah Mubarak. <laughs> So if somebody wanted to fund your dawah, Akhi, um, is there any way to do that? 
Yeah, alhamdulillah, just uh, just the YouTube, the Muslim Lantern, and inshallah, you find all the links there. Uh, so you see the Muslim Lantern there, down when I'm speaking. You just type the Muslim Lantern, inshallah. It's very easy. Alhamdulillah. All right. Next one. I can put myself in the shoes of the non-Muslim, but I cannot do that with the one who is attacking because um, we'll mind my own business. I'll have a time... I'll have a timer focus in attacking Islam. And yes, I remember you. Um, it didn't want to answer where you're from. Barakallahu feekum. It, it is a bit difficult, but that's why it's a skill that you have to build over time, you know? And recognizing if someone's attacking Islam, yani, like why even engage with that person, mm. right? And, and one important thing to keep in mind is that not everyone can do da'wah. It's something we need to understand. Not everyone can do... When I say da'wah, I'm talking about one-to-one -one street engagement da'wah. Mm -hmm. Everyone can do da'wah in different ways, supporting the da'wah, donating, sending messages, texting. Not everyone can. Some people might have literal anger issues. An individual mm -hmm. like that cannot engage in the da'wah. Like, I know some people like that. We give them different tasks, like uh, film. Film the da'wah, stay away, do this, do that. Okay, organize the books. He can do something else. And he himself will tell you, I cannot control my anger. So some individuals, if they have certain problems, it can be a barrier from them from doing this physical one-to-one -one da'wah. That's why Allah Azza wa Jal did not just choose anyone to do, deliver the message. He chose the best mm -hmm. of creation to deliver the message. So we need to oh, understand yeah. that not everyone is able to do this one-to-one -one as well. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. Beautifully put. Do we have any more? All right. Assalamu alaikum. How, can I, how should I answer the following question if someone asked it? It's a cute well, <laughs> That's cute picture, picture. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they asked what is my role if Allah is the one who guides slash sends people astray yeah Allah Azzawajal answers the same thing in the Quran is he, answer, he answers it in chapter uh, 16 of the Quran Surah al -Nahl. verse 100 and something I'm not remembering exactly verse what but if you search the verse that says those uh, who lie are those who don't believe in the verses of Allah the next few verses will explain to you where Allah Azzawajal says that those people what Allah seals their heart are the people who choose this life over the afterlife. So it's a consequence of their choice. Also, Allah mm -hmm. says, When they got gone astray, Allah let their hearts go astray. Mm -hmm. So you need to understand it's a concept of qadr. You need to understand what qadr is very well as a Muslim. It's one of the pillars of your iman or your faith. You need to understand it. And we believe that we have a choice and we believe that Allah doesn't force us to do things which uh, which deals with our where we're going to end up in the afterlife we choose to do these things. Mm -hmm. and in the same time they're under allah's will and allah's power and control mm -hmm. allah also says in surah al-baqarah that allah never misguides except those that are defiantly disobedient so it's the people that you know not all the time are the people that genuinely want the truth and are seeking the truth and making dua for guidance because we know the absolutely. dua of guidance is never rejected absolutely 100%. All right, Assalamu alaikum, brothers. One of the problems I have got with my uh, Christian peers is that almost none of them refer to their scriptures when trying to counter my points to the point where I run out of patience but not flip out on them. Well, subhanAllah, do you mention that to them or not is a question. Do you say to them that, look, uh, I can only engage with you based on the scripture that you believe in because it's, it's your presentation of your religion. And then you can say to them that if you do not like believe in that scripture, then we can engage in a different way. Like, what, I'll tell you something very important. And I want to mention that because I just heard it recently. One brother doing da'wah. I'm not going to mention who, right? But the point is the woman, she's coming and she asked him a question about the Quran. What he did is he straight away went to the Bible. Okay. Then that woman, she said, oh, you know very well about the Bible, but you don't know about your book, right? <laughs> so the problem is what we end up happening today is people who are Bible scholars. We don't need them. They know nothing about Islam, and they only know about the Bible as Muslims, and they go, they engage with the Christians. Mm. That's not da'wah. That's not what da'wah is. That's not how da'wah ever was done. Your da'wah is invitation to Islam. If you don't put forward Islam, you're not really doing da'wah. You're just engaging in an intellectual discourse with someone, right? And even the question is, is it even, even permissible for you to be reading the scriptures of the people of the book mm. without gaining basic knowledge? Most of the scholars will say mm. to you, no. And you can read what Ibn Hajar says about that. Ibn Hajar Asqalani, when he explains the hadith with the Prophet wasalam, told Umar ibn Khattab, why are you reading in the... This was Umar ibn Khattab. Yeah? Why are you reading? Wow. You don't need to read it. So you, you're reading these scriptures and going into details and you don't even know anything about your religion is a big problem. Mm. Your religion comes first. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, a very beautiful point. Honestly, subhanAllah, I, I would love to continue the conversation. If you have any more super chats, we could put up, but I think it's Maghrib where you're at. And I don't want to be the reason for you not breaking your fast ASAP because the Sunnahs too break it yes, uh, uh, yeah, upon uh, Maghrib. 
No, so, we're done. There's just uh, two quick ones. Uh, please convert Aisha's speed. It's not Allah who can. Yeah, it's it's not yeah. us who converts. It's Allah. We're open to having a discussion with him if he's open, inshallah. Um, and then inshallah, me and Rami, uh, there's a question we'll answer, but we'll let the brother go, inshallah. It was a pleasure. Yeah, and and inshallah, extend the invitation as well to anyone who is well known on social media who's who is curious or interested to learn about Islam. Anyone who even is, has a history of even attacking Islam or criticizing Islam, we're able to have intellectual and discussion with those people they're welcome anyone welcome anytime inshallah we'll make time for you don't worry we fly over to your country with whatever you need don't worry <laughs> we engage with you inshallah, inshallah brother okay, no. when we come to the uk inshallah we're gonna come through and meet you and inshallah. Uh, inshallah. likewise become my pleasure Toronto, we're always here it was a pleasure may allah bless you and elevate you barakallah for having me may allah azawajal accept from us inshallah yalla assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam 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 all right, so this question What if this world is all we have, or what we have? Well, Very I mean, uh, Alhamdulillah, firstly, we do have the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us here, but He didn't put us here without a reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said, He did not create jinn or mankind except to worship Allah. And what is worship? Worship is who you submit to in every way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to pray to Him, He commands us to fast for Him. He commands us to do things sincerely for his sake and to avoid things for his sake. And a part of worship is obe obedience, obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala over your own you know, desires, over the other people who are trying to perhaps misguide you away from Allah. And as the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, there is no obedience to the people with disobedience to Allah. So this world, alhamdulillah, is um, something that we have actually been blessed with because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put us here to allow us to elevate ourselves, inshallah, in the afterlife. And Hmm. For you to believe, if 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 you or anyone thinks that this world is all we have, um, I think that's actually very problematic. Because what was there before the world? And how did the world come to be in the first place? And after the world dissipates and disappears or pops out of existence, why would you not assume that something else would come after that? You were nothing, <clears throat> right? You were nothing at one point. Just like us, we were nothing. We didn't exist. We were, we were technically in a state of death because we weren't alive. And then, boom, all of a sudden, we came to life. Just like mm. that. And then we're going to die. We know that for a fact. So why are we not going to assume that we're going to come back to life afterwards? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us very clearly in the Quran, He asks, do you not think that we're able to rise you again, to raise you again, to replicate your entire body, even down to your very fingertips and your, your fingerprints? Mm. SubhanAllah. SubhanAllah. All right, all right. Guys, comment down below if you want us to bring back Brother Muhammad Ali, the Muslim Lantern. Smash that like button, share this video or stream with somebody that might benefit or even if you don't think they'll benefit, but there's a possibility they might share it. Inshallah, you got the reward that all of us have gained, which is the blessing and wisdom and knowledge from this beautiful brother, inshallah. inshallah. And with this being said, Brother Rami, is there anything else? Just a final dua, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for our shortcomings. And reward us and accept from us our good deeds. Allahumma. I mean, anything bad is from ourselves and shaitan. Anything good is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and allow us to be leaders for the righteous. Allahumma. I mean, and with that being said, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam.